Uh, hello, everyone. And uh, yeah, I see more people than I expected. That's kind of surprising for the BMC talk because it means people know the, what the BMC is. So, well, uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, my name is Adam, and together with Alex, uh, uh, we have a pleasure to be here. So, thanks, uh, DEFCON organizer, for allowing us to be here today, first time in the row as a speaker. And uh, thanks for you, great audience, that you know what the BMC is. So, really, thank you, guys. Um, so, what is our talk about? Our talk is about breaking BMC, the forgotten key to a kingdom. Uh, so, yeah, it's a niche topic, uh, but apparently it's not as niche as I wanted to be. <laughs> uh, uh, so, two sentences about ourselves. Um, we don't want to spend too much time here because it's a boring stuff. Uh, both of us, me and Alex, uh, we're working in NVIDIA during this research, and everything when we done, it was apparently as part of our work at NVIDIA. Uh, we don't want to spend uh, too long here. There is some private contact information to us. You can always poke us through the email or through the Twitter. If you have any questions, just feel free to shoot us in a message. And there is some short bio. Uh, but it doesn't really matter. What matters, this is not only the research for two of us, but for an entire NVIDIA offensive security research team, which I'm currently leading. So big kudos also to Jared, Max, and Nicola, who also did this research together with us. So first thing first, what is BMC? But I expect you know, it's a baseboard management controller. It's a very special um, service uh, processor which you can see. So that is an old picture from 2006. We didn't have time to take a new one, so we just make a small adjustment to look it more modern. So there is 2022 year, uh, but physically it doesn't change too much. And uh, we did this research in 2022 uh, for one of the BMC from one of the vendor, which we are not going to mention, but it's visible in the, in the picture. And so what physically BMC does, it's apparently used to control uh, the data centers, especially the hosts. And the reason why, because you can imagine there could be like 100 of the host machine on the data center, 1,000 host machine, and sometimes even 100 of the 1,000 of the machine. Some of them are not even accessible physically because they might be somewhere in the water, so it's very difficult to go there and do anything physically. Sometimes they still do, so you can still go physically to this machine and do whatever you need to do, but of course, as you can imagine, it's not a scalable uh, um, solution. So that's why we do have BMCs that can do it for us remotely, they can do it um, everything what you can physically do by yourself. So uh, it's a essentially ser a specialized service uh, processor that can monitor the physical state um, of the computer, not only computer, but any network server, hardware, and uh, they're using sensor essentially to be able to communicate to the administrator of, of this device. What is also interesting, they allow you to do a full control of the machine which they monitor. So you could have something like a KVM. Um, capabilities. So you can go remotely to the BMC and you can then reconfigure the host. You can go to the BIOS. You can change the BIOS settings if you want to remotely. You can do whatever you want, essentially. Even more, you can flash the entire firmware of the controlled device. And what is even more funny, you can do it even when the device is powered off. So BMC, as you can see, is very powerful service processor. Uh, so that's why it's a very interesting um, target uh, for the attacker because it gives at, at first tons of the benefits, and also it falls into the category like hack one, rule them all. You just hack one BMC, and you contro have control over entire data center which BMC physically control. So it's like a great and juicy target. And uh, Alex now will talk about the first issue which we want to cover here. Uh, BMC speaks IPMI protocol. And uh, when you encounter a system that speaks IPMI, what would you check for? Of course, for a hash leak that has been known since 2013. So what is this? This is a um, screenshot from a manual uh, that describes the, the IPMI standard. And this is an explanation how the authentication works in IPMI. So you see here, um, uh, there are two messages. One of the messages is sent from the administrator console to the BMC. Uh, and the administrator is also only supposed to send the username to the BMCs, while the BMC looks up the username and calculates the HMAC over some data, which includes the username. So the password for the user that is about to be authenticated is used as a key to this HMAC encryption, uh, uh, HMAC calculation. 
Uh, so this uh, HMAC calculation result is sent back to the administrator. So if uh, an attacker knows the correct username that exists in a database for BMC users, uh, he can receive the hash calculated um, and uh, the password will be used as a key to this HMAC. And this has been known since 2003 where this uh, standard has been published. So you might think, is it fixed now, by now in 2023? No, actually it's not because it's in the standard. So if you IP speak IPMI, IPMI, you have to do the same way. Uh, the authentication process looks exactly the same. And uh, we implemented the uh, script just to test this and it, uh, we found out that uh, actually the system that we were looking at um, conforms to the same standard. But we had a problem while um, figure out the, figuring out the correct username that we can use because, uh, you know, uh, if we don't know the username that, uh, the, any username that exists in the user database, uh, we will not get this uh, hash back. So we had a problem here. We don't have a valid username. How can we guess it or how can we uh, f find out this correct username? At least one. So. Uh, you see uh, the server always rec um, responds with unauthorized name what, for whatever name we try. So uh, we had this idea of uh, looking for uh, some issues with uh, incorrect processing of this user sensitive data, for example the username. And uh, we found out a, a bug that it is actually present on this system and uh, we, uh, the CVs for this bug are issued by AMI and NVIDIA, you see it here. So what, is, what exactly is happening? So when a user sends a username to the BMC in order to authenticate, uh, it, uh, the, the length of the username is also sent in the same message. And we had an idea that maybe, maybe the server uh, processes this username in a, uh, not in not a constant time. For example, if it compares the username with some database entries, it uses maybe it uses memcompare. Who knows? Uh, and uh, we implemented a script that uh, measures the time that it takes for a certain user, uh, a certain message to pro be processed by the server by the BMC. And uh, Eventually, we got this result. Let me show you the demo. So we're sending a bunch of uh, message ones which are defined in the standard and we, uh, we are basically doing a brute force for the uh, printable characters as uh, usernames, available for usernames, but uh, we use this time in Oracle uh, to greatly speed up the brute force. You see we, uh, we, we begin with measuring the time that it takes for the server to process uh, the usernames which are only one character long. And for all like uh, 200 possible um, values for this character, we measure the time that it takes for the server to process it. And we find the time, the longest time. So we find this symbol that takes the longest time to process. And uh, it is very likely that it, this is the uh, correct symbol, the first symbol of the username because when the mem compare advances to the next symbol, it takes a little bit more time to process. So this is, this is why we, um, uh, we can uh, use the first guest symbol and advance to the next one. So essentially we do this uh, in a sequence and we don't brute force the whole key space. We just uh, move from one symbol to another and, uh, and uh, do it a few times in a row just to um, get beta data to measure the re response time. But uh, essentially this uh, works really well on local networks. And uh, you see here um, we were able to guess the right username and uh, eventually uh, when we send this username uh, to authentication server, we get back the uh, hash, the HMAC calculation result, and we just brute force it uh, using normal methods on offline. So this is attack can be ha can be happening completely offline. So we here we use a word list and we are able to guess the right password. 
this is the explanation why this works. So uh, by this moment, we didn't have access to any binaries for the BMC. We didn't f uh, have any so access to the source code. So uh, this is just an ex uh, a picture that uh, explains to you why this attack works. Uh, you see this mem compare. This is a usual mem compare from libc. Uh, it does not execute in a constant time. This is why it can be used as a timing oracle here. So if you look up the man page for mem compare, it says that don't use it for sensitive data. And this is a sensitive data. So now, now we have access to the BMC. We guess the, the username and the password. So uh, we only got one uh, user uh, um, information from the BMC. So, but we can talk to it. We can issue um, requests that require authentication. So sure, as you can see, to put a bit more to this story, we just saw a BMC. We know it's there. We know there is a known bug from 2006 with the CV from 2013, which we didn't expect to work, but it works. So interesting. We wanted to log in. It was just pure guess. Like, okay, let's try timing attack. Like, why not? Like, many like devices are vulnerable, and turns out we have CVE. So okay, we log in. One of the devices which BMC managed looks like this is a screenshot of the web interface. So looks cool. So why we even speaking more about that. Like, okay, we have access to BMCU, so what? So that's exactly a question. What to do next? And we have a couple of ideas. We could stop presentation here, but we did not, and we did a bit more um, research. And the reason why, because at first we wanted to understand a lot of stuff about BMC, which we did not. At first, why this timing oracle at first worked? Because we did not know why this timing even works. We wanted to find the BMC image, we wanted to reverse this BMC image, and to be able to understand why this timing attack works at first place. And to be able to do that, we need to have somehow access to the BMC image, yes? We also thought, okay, if the timing oracle works, maybe there is more bugs, yes? Why not? So we need to have image to be able to find more bugs there. And uh, also, again, we did not know too much at the time about internal architecture of the BMC, so we wanted to learn more, uh, like what is apparently there inside of this BMC, excluding these timing attacks which we found. And also we wanted to analyze, okay, if maybe there is some other bugs which are uh, good to exploit, what are the uh, difficulties of doing that? Like, are there any kind of defense or hardening or mitigation techniques? What's the state of art of the security of the BMC image? And to be able to do that, we need to somehow get this BMC image, yes? So how do you get the BMC image? Yes, that's the question. So we had an idea like BMC still has a firmware, yes? So this firmware must be somehow updated. So if people update the firmware, how many of people like delete the updates after they update the firmware. So we had this idea maybe of some of the host machine will have the, you know, not deleted updates for the firmware. So let's get now, because we have in the BMC access to the BMC, and we know that BMC has uh, like capabilities of KVM, let's go from the BMC to the host and grab the updates for the BMC image, and then we can have ability to analyze that. So the question, how do we go from the BMC uh, to the host and get the shell? So, of course, it's not as difficult because we have KVM capabilities, so let's go very old school techniques, change the bootloader command and put in it bin bash. Uh, of course, sometimes my not that feature works because you might have secure boot and maybe the comments are assigned, etc. But again, we are in the KVM. So why not to go to the BIOS if there is no password and disable secure boot? We are at BMC. So there is a lot of opportunities to do so. So we went to the least difficult path, just change the command line, bin bash, and we end up there. So yeah, we have shell. And the disk somehow is not encrypted. Surprise. So we are able now to go and see what is in the host machine. Uh, but then we also realize we are also able to mount whatever image we want. So even if the init bin bash won't work, we can do a booting attack, disable secure boot, and just load our own image if you want to. But we combine two of these features, apparently. We just put init bin bash, have a shell, and we just mount our, our tool set. Uh, to be able to run the commands on the host machine, which are not installed on that specific host. So what command we wanted to run? So we found the BMC image, but we don't know how this firmware image looks like, what is inside. So we wrote like custom a tool to be able to parse this image. And so you can see here, 
we found um, interesting stuff like there is um, uh, essentially model bootloader, model JFFS2, there is model in RAM CRAMFS, and one of them is a root partition, as you can see here. And this root partition starts from the address um, 2500,000. So, what we did, we just very simple stuff dump, uh, we know exactly how the header looks like, we know what is inside of this firmware because we just passed that. So, we just do DD dump all of this byte data and we mount into the loopback and now now we can able to browse um, the, the, the BMC and analyze that. So what did we find there? During analysis, we found at first that BMC uh, includes the IPMI server binary and libraries. And uh, so, what we saw in this interface on the screenshot, which we showed you before, is just a very small subset of all of the APIs, which are and capabilities and functionalities which BMC physically can provide you. So, it's a very small subset of the feature. And then, we starting to analyze on the BMC, is there's like a tons of other protocols which are apparently communicating with the BMC and you can poke. So, then we found out that you can just directly send APMI messages to the BMC and bypass all of these web interfaces which they have which they expose and you have like a tons of the functionality there's tons of the hidden API which is accessible especially if you have like username and password but you can just poke so as you can imagine the attack surface is pretty huge so we pull a trigger to find out let's find out more bugs and this is one of the bugs which now Alex will cover as well yeah, we started to poke to this uh, firmware uh, image and uh, found another issue that is identified by these CVs by MI and NVIDIA. Uh, essentially, we found out that the user database that is stored and uh, that uh, is implemented in this uh, BMC is managed by Redis database. And what is more interesting, uh, the passwords are encrypted in this database, so it's stored in an encrypted state, but the keys the, which are used to encrypt this password are stored right next to the passwords. So, does it make much sense? But uh, um, the question is why do they even have this uh, obfuscated passwords in the database? Why do not hash the passwords instead? So, the, the answer to that is uh, the same issue with IPMI protocol. They need these uh, plain text passwords to be able to authenticate users. That's why. Uh, so, we found a really nice uh, API that can be accessed from the host, which uh, is a local access, considered local, uh, which is not ac uh, accessible remotely. Uh, so this uh, API allows you to um, do specific requests to the to this Redis database. So we we uh, analyzed the image and found the correct keys, like the names of the keys that has to be accessed in order to read these passwords and the usernames and the keys. And we implemented the uh, proof of concept that just accesses this user database through this API and reads the encrypted passwords and then the, the keys uh, from the same database to, and decrypts the passwords. So at this point we got uh, full user database for the BMC, so f uh, usernames and the passwords in a decrypted form. Uh, so we proceeded to analyze the uh, the firmware. We found another issue uh, which uh, is also interesting, which I will talk you uh, talk about. Uh, this is also identified by the CVs from IMI and NVIDIA. Uh, so there is a server that is actually a IPMI server that listens on a socket on the BMC side and services all these uh, requests that comes f uh, remotely. Uh, and this particular API allows you to read um, any virtual memory within the context of this process, of, of the server process. Uh, so there is um, special uh, command that prepares some data before uh, so it has to be issued before you access this uh, API but also uh, you only need to have the username and the password the like usual username and the password for the BMC in order to issue this command you cannot do, do it without any authentication but at this point we already have the username and password so we can just proceed uh, as you see here there are no checks whatsoever ab about the region or the size of the data that we want to read um, you can just read anything from this context of the IPMI server. And this is how we found out that, for example, the server uh, always uses the same base for, for, I mean, it's executed as the same base uh, every time you, you boot the BMC, so there is no SLR. And uh, you see here there are no checks for the sizes. 
uh, and this is the counterpart of this read API. Uh, this one writes arbitrary data to this context of this IPMI server process. So we can use it to write uh, any data or code that we want to this server pro uh, process. Uh, so that is very useful if you want to build a shell code inside the process, yes? So uh, at this point we could use this API to execute any code we want inside the, uh, in the context of this IPMI server process. This is how you, uh, the actual overwrite happens. You, you see there is a usual mem copy operation with also without any checks for the address and the size. And this is the proof of concept for this particular issue. Uh, first we identify that the server process is actually uh, is located at 10,000 hex. So the, there is no SLR, but we know the base of this module, so we can just read uh, arbitrary data from it. And we are interested in reading a special array of the configuration array for these features available in this server, we, which are controlled by this G-Core features array. And uh, in, particular, in particular, we are interested in uh, this offset 310, 310 hex. Uh, and if we enable, uh, the, if we set a bit at this uh, location, the server now thinks that certain functionality has been enabled. And this functionality al allows you to download arbitrary files from BMC. By default, this is disabled, but since we have a write primitive, we can now enable it. And we use this functionality to test and, and download ETC shadow. Why not? And you see that with dot dot slash dot dot slash uh, string, we, are, we were able to do it. So uh, Adam will talk about, about this download functionality in detail. Uh, so yeah, first, no SLR to recap. And the second thing what we wanted to recap, so we found now read and write capabilities to entire IPMI process um, and BMC server, so essentially we can enable and disable whatever feature we want. Of course, why want to do it? Because you can still exploit that, but yeah, we just wanted to find out what other hidden features we have. So we identified this CV, um, which is assigned by AMI and NVIDIA, which, uh, as Alex mentioned, um, the feature itself is nothing wrong with the feature, yes? You have a feature who allows you to download just a file. Sometimes you might want to do it, why not? But the way how the programmer implemented that is again old school 90s way of implementing downloading the file. So as you can see here, if you at first enable this feature, this is the offset. Um, then this feature is available, and if it's available, they construct the path you can see on the bottom here. So the get file path is static, but the file path and uh, but file name directly comes from the package from the user. So it's coming from the user. Of course, we just do very old school da dash dash dot dash dot slash dash dash slash, and that's how we achieve ability to be able to uh, download an arbitrary file. So that's what is exploited here on the bottom. Uh, so yeah, uh, it's interesting way, uh, and even more when we <laughs> wanted to put more about this feature, like how did they implement that? We also find out you can also choose the offset from where you want to start reading the file. So if the file is too big, you can just jump to specific offset. This is exactly FSEQ, and it's without any validation, just come from the from the user. So it's not only reading the file, but also you can choose which portion of the file precisely you can read. And another bug which we found is identified by this CV numbers and by AMI and NVIDIA. And this uh, bug uh, is exactly in the SNMP protocol, uh, like a functionality for SN SN SNMP. We call it SNMP injection. So what happens, SN uh, SNMP is enabled by default, so we didn't need to use read-write primitive to enable this feature. And it allows you to change the configuration of SNMP server. But whenever you send a new package that you want to reload or change the SNMP configuration, um, the way how they implemented this logic, it's kind of unique for the developer C developers, so they create a file, new SNMP configuration file from C using this uh, path of commands like SNMP5 and system. So every line of the of the configuration is dynamically created by executing system command, and um, it, that's a unique way of creating configuration file. <laughs> uh, so we were surprised. Uh, but what is more interesting, let's see what's the arguments for these system commands, yes? And we found out that these um, error read-only community uh, variables, but also RW community, these two variables there, 
are essentially directly read from the from the user from the package yes so and it's enabled by default so essentially what we do you can do just a very simple again 90s comment injection so we just implemented this as a proof of concept and uh, we didn't know if this bug works or not so we combined with the previous exploit of downloading arbitrary file so we just uh, did comment injection who's supposed to create a new file and then we use previous bug to download if this file is created and so here we inject um, the command echo high tmp a uh, and then first thing what we wanted to check how the new configuration for SNMP uh, configuration works so because if the command is injected this RO command and RW command supposed to have null attached so we don't know this file and you can see there's no arguments for these two so likely our command was injected and then we download our TMP a file using this previous bug and yes it exists so essentially you have command injection now <laughs> And the next bug uh, will be covered by Alex oh, before we go there. So essentially, you don't physically need to write like a very complicated exploit and proof of concept. The reason why, because we have from the GitHub APMI tool. And APMI tool allows you just to be normally executed as a feature. That's, that's how you run this command. And then you will be able to exploit uh, that specific command injection bug. You just run the tool with this command, and you have command injection. So yay. And this bug will be covered by Alex. Yeah, th this is also identified by these CVs by my and NVIDIA. Uh, this is another in uh, shell injection in uh, another component of the uh, BMC. So the SNMP was not accessible, the SNMP config was not accessible from the web UI that is available to administrator when logs in. But this one is enabled. So you can uh, set NTP servers that, uh, th that will be used by BMC to set the time on the device. Uh, so there is a, also a IPMI counterpart so for this API. So you can uh, call this API to set primary and secondary NTP servers or enable and disable this functionality, uh, whatever you want. So um, if you enable the functionality, you can set the, let's say, primary NTP server with this uh, API. But uh, the way they parse these uh, uh, addresses for the servers is interesting. Uh, yeah, this is this is where you set this NTP server. Yes, yeah, so sir. Uh, you see here, if this functionality is enabled, uh, line 42, uh, you, the code proceeds to just uh, print the uh, the full string f that you specify as an address for the primary server uh, to this buffer, and later it is saved in the configuration. And when the conf when the code is a uh, about to read this configuration, this is how it, uh, it is implemented. They read this uh, string without any checks to, to the local buffer on stack, and then they do printf operation to, to build a command line string, which uh, is supposed to be passed to this NTP date tool. Uh, so NTP date will be executed with the arguments that basically are user controlled uh, or attacker controlled. Uh, so here you have another kind of uh, shell injection. There is no validation for this server uh, address. Uh, and you can pass any string that will be processed as a server address and the NTP date will be executed uh, with this string attached to the command line. So this is very easy uh, uh, case for a shell injection. And it just executes this command with NTP date. Uh, so what we did, we implemented a proof of concept f that calls this API and sets the server primary NTP address of uh, server for uh, uh, for this string. So you see 127.001, and then echo test. So we write some data to the just temporary file, and then we read this file using our download file exploit, and just to v to see if it was created or not. And actually. Uh, we see that the file is created. So when you when this uh, NTP uh, functionality is restarted, the new config file is generated, and this NTP date um, tool is executed with our string. And you see that we were able to download a TMP test file. This is how we can now in, uh, execute arbitrary shell commands on the BMC side, or we can use this to write arbitrary files on the BMC side. 
so we now we were thinking what can be done else uh, how can we attack the host in any in interesting way so we had full access to BMC we can execute arbitrary code we can inject shell commands read and, uh, and write any files on BMC site so we found this interesting bug that is not related to BMC anymore it is more related to the host this is identified by these CVEs. Uh, so there is an API on the BMC side that can be used to uh, perform the update operations on the host flash, the spy flash of the host. So we can talk to BMC and ask it to uh, please flash this uh, piece of data to this location on the host flash. Uh, this is how they implemented it. Uh, so the, the host spy is just mounted as a block device here and they open it as a file and just seek to a location that we want and write the data. Or this one, this code just reads the data. Okay, so we, first we want to, to be sure that we are going to overwrite the location that we want to overwrite. So we read the data from that location, we see uh, is this the right place and uh, if it's all good we can write data to it or erase it first and then write. And this is the uh, counterpart that performs the write uh, operation to this flash. Uh, just usual uh, write up, um, call write API. So again, there is no validation. We can overwrite any location on the host flash. What can we do with this? We can uh, install persistent uh, implants on the host uh, by using this uh, functionality. And this is what we did. Uh, we just uh, um, read the location 37000 on the host flash and uh, we, we wanted to see some NVRAM structures on this host uh, flash at that location and this is what we actually get. get. We, we see that there is a, an a NVRAM, a NVRAM structures, the, uh, the NVRAM variable structures on this uh, data. So this is the correct place. This is where the NVRAM uh, is, uh, starts on this host spy flash. Then we erase this data. There is another API uh, on this BMC that we can use to erase this page of spy flash. And then we write our updated data to the spy flash. And here you see we write hello DEFCOM. Hello. <laughs> we were able to install uh, persistent uh, malware on this host flash. Now you cannot just uh, reset the machine to a non good state. You have to refresh the firmware first. Uh, so, yeah, now we, I think we broke BMC pretty well. We have command injection. We can do spy flash write read. We can download any file. We do see that the bugs from 2006 still works. So, why we even bother more? <laughs> So we thought, okay, let's find some holy grail of the bugs. We do not allow, do, does not require some authentication at all. And we found one. And this is identified by this CV number by AMI and NVIDIA. So we found remote stack overflow in the pre-authentication phase. And um, yeah, knowing the state of the previous bug, we expected how difficult it will be to exploit remotely stack overflow in the pre-authentication phase. Uh, so at first the bug is here. There is a telemetry uh, shared library. Essentially, if you authenticate, you could have uh, like a telemetry enabled, essentially meaning, okay, let's log in who log into the BMC, which, which username, etc. So, yeah, that's the feature. Uh, the, this feature, the way how they implemented when uh, the, the telemetry calls, essentially it's here. You can see there is a string and copy. And as a parameters to string and copy to the local buffer, local buffer is a static buffer on the stack. Um, they get the username from the package, and the length of the username is also coming from the package because uh, why not? Uh, and essentially, directly after the string copy, there is a function pointer which is coming from the shell library, and it's called immediately after the overflow. And uh, yeah, so we thought how difficult it is to be able to exploit the stack overflow in 2023, we find out there's no stack canaries uh, to our surprise. So, yeah, and then we saw, okay, what about other mitigation? So, there is stack is also executable and there is no SLR. In, so, yeah, but we thought it will be too easy maybe to exploit just return address. So, um, there is a function pointer. So, let's try to see where the function pointer is declared. So, this is the local buffer, it's 16 bytes long for the username, so it's not too long. And apparently, after the buffer, there is no function pointer. Function pointer is 
above the buffer, so we couldn't use these cool techniques to override the function pointer, so we need to switch to the standard stack overflow and um, and just override the return address on the stack. And because of no SLR executable stack, it gives us a bit uh, less relaxed time. And uh, yes, this is exactly in the pre authentication phase. So, this is a slide which Alex explained at the beginning when you just send the first package with the username. This username length just can cause you stack overflow in the pre authentication phase. So, yeah, we pull the trigger and you wrote that exploit. Why not? So, this is exactly the authentication phase. As you can see, we send a RKP message with a very long username, and as a reply, we're supposed to say you're authenticated or not. And as a reply, instead, we just overwrite the, the messages and the logic on the server, and we just say hello, DEFCON. So, yes, that's pre authentication stack overflow. <laughs> Thanks. So, in fact, we found many more bugs. <laughs> this is just a few of them. To our surprise, yes? <laughs> Who would expect that? And uh, so, yeah, that's the, all of the CVEs which we found. There is uh, around 20 of them, but we only covered during this talk these bugs. So, there is so much more to tell you about uh, the state of the security there and the bugs which we found. And uh, just a summary to recap what we saw. So, at first, BMC, of course, is a very critical part of the security of the entire ecosystem. And breaking BMC, unfortunately, or fortunately, depends who you ask, uh, falls into the category of break one to rule them all. You just have one component BMC and you have access to all of the host servers. So it's a nice feature. And unfortunately, BMC didn't get too much attention from the security research uh, community, which is kind of reflected in the current state of the security of it. Uh, what I mean essentially, we're still missing a lot of like modern mitigation and the hardening, which are expected to have in 2023, like stack overflows shouldn't be as easy exploitable, like stack cookies are kind of standard for some decades at least. And yeah, some of the essential vulnerabilities would still fall into the category let's exploit something like in the 90s, yes? So what we can do with this? First thing first, probably some kind of recommendation of secure coding practice supposed to be established when we develop such kind of firmware, some kind of SDLC process. Also, heavy fuzzing could help finding such kind of low-hanging fruits. So we also ask ourselves, how is it possible that this pre-authenticated stack overflow was not found before? Because it's 16 bytes long buffer doesn't seem like too difficult to overflow, but apparently the tool on the user side limits you how long username you can get. So the tool just was limiting up to 16 bytes, not the server. So probably that's why. Uh, also, switching to memory safe language could help and remove such kind of um, basic memory safety issue. But there is a catch, as you can s which, which we describe in this talk. Many of these bugs will not be affected by the memory safe language. Yes, the command injection, the downloading of the file, path traversal. It will, you know, it's a state of the security, not the state of the language. Yes, and uh, so not everything could be solved by that. And of course, investing in the security research could help, and is recommended to improve overall state of the BMC. And as an acknowledge, we would like to thank NVIDIA, of course, especially offensive security research team like, in, you know, like Jared, Max, and Nikola because they did this research with us. Server folks that allows us to touch this very expensive hardware and they were not scared to give it to our hand. We were scared to touch them, but they don't, so thanks. And product security team for handling all of this um, coordination disclosure. Thank you very much. And everyone, and of course, Ami for allowing us doing this amazing research. So if you have any question, feel free to shoot us. We try to answer. Okay, so the answer is 
because we analyzed this BMC first on our product, so we wanted to have NVIDIA customers secure as fast as possible, so we release the CV faster and do some changes by ourselves, but in the same time we need to go to um, the vendor and do coordination disclosure, and it was taking a bit more time for them to patch uh, as a reference code, which could be moved to everybody who uses the B BMC. So yeah, there's a time difference between we did the patches and between uh, before the vendor did the patches in the reference code. So yeah, that's the reason it's the different here. Yeah. It's a good question, just to repeat. Uh, so the question is, um, because there's time difference between when we found the bug and when NVIDIA fixed the issues and between when the AMI fixed the issues and we released the advisor a bit faster to make the protected uh, customers also easier, um, the um, malicious actor could get our like patches and trying to reverse engineer to find out if other vendors are also vulnerable. So I don't think there's a good answer for that. It's a supply chain issue. So there are uh, startups who can address the supply chain um, security of the state and they could help. Uh, but yeah, that's essentially the industry has some problems which needed reaction which we cannot solve by ourselves and we need the uh, entire community to work together to make it more secure and yes, that's a valid point and I 100% agree with that statement. Yes? Do you have an idea of uh, about how many devices this might affect? Uh, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have an idea about how many? <laughs> no, let's say no. <laughs> But yeah, it's also a valid point. Unfortunately, because BMC is it's it's essentially affecting like a lot of vendors, so yeah, the impact is high, yes. Okay. We try not to touch redfish. <laughs> but it's a very good question. <laughs> Correct. Yes. Correct. And also requires them to not only patch but also force clients to flush the firmware. <laughs> The question is how do we interface with the device when we do this timing attack? Uh, by sending UDP packets remotely. Yeah. In fact, if you look for the demo, it was not like a single shot. We repeated the same uh, character multiple times and get an average time because latency, etc. But it's practical, it works. Uh, so the question is why they do not run Linux by Arthos, correct? Other way around? Why they run uh, and they run Linux not the Arthos? Uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, I have no idea. We apparently do not have much visibility of uh, what the vendor does. Apparently, if you think about the industry of the BMC, there is not as many solutions that you can choose. You can either use OpenBMC, which requires you to essentially set up a team, hire people who do manage to be able, like entire process of creating the firmware, the BMC firmware, and then you can do, have like more influence on the security state, or you can go to the vendor and the vendor just give you the, you know, the image, and it's mostly it's out of your hand what you can do there. You can ask the vendor to do some, you know, changes or alignments, but you are pretty limited how much you can influence that. that. And this is, was one of the reasons why we apparently pulled the trigger and see, okay, let's analyze and find out what did we get. <laughs> uh, 
so the question is, are there any firmware security tools which we recommend? Yes. Uh, fuzzing. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. Uh, Alex? Yeah, I don't know, to be honest. <laughs> but yes. Uh, yes, so for us it was, um, we did slightly opposite, yes, because we saw there is a BMC, we didn't have any idea how to, you know, be able to get into this BMC, so our research was apparently, okay, we, now we can poke it, so let's try to log in. We cannot log in, let's try timing attack, and then so on, so on, so on. But yes, there is many interfaces, especially to the APMI, but most of them require authentication, that's why username finding will be the best, like, uh, the entry point. <laughs> But yes, and there is also a local uh, local interface from the host, so host can talk to BMC through KCS interfaces. And yeah. Yeah. Well, some API are not reach. Uh, so question is, uh, what's the interface for that we can use to access BMC? So some API uh, that BMC pr um, interfaces are not reachable remotely. So some uh, of them uh, have to be reached from the host locally and this is why we, we need to have host access. So we got the shell on the host first. Yeah. Uh, like this Redis database with this surprise API give me all of your database. It was through the host. It's a pretty nice feature for attacker I guess. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, we cannot release the PSCs. <laughs> At least for now. <laughs> okay, thank you very much again.